Hello and welcome to uh, uh, our new employment salon. Our new employment salon will be on career guidance, employment services and career guidance. We do these salons uh, as a series. We have several salons already on our YouTube channel, Future of Employment Services. So you're very welcome to um, subscribe to it, to like it, to watch it, to comment on it as you see fit. Today we have a very interesting group of speakers on the topic of career guidance. And uh, we will go into the discussion in a moment. Um, just around the table or around my screen, how they appear is uh, Claudia Liebenberg from Bundesagentur für Arbeit, which is the German Public Employment Service. Anke Zapaun, who is uh, from the Croatian Employment Service, the Public Employment Service. François de Morat from the International Labour Organization and Deidre Hughes from the Warwick University. My name is Miguel Peromingo. I will be introducing and moderating this event, and I'm here with Eamon Dabern. Um, we're both public, uh, we're both private consultants uh, on the topic of employment services, working in that area for a fairly long time, and um, very interested in touching on all kinds of topics, especially on how to make, and this is also what we're doing on our channel, uh, to make employment services more partnership oriented to foster partnership between the different actors and stakeholders, and also to make it more human-centered and client-centered. And the topic of career guidance uh, contributes to that as well. The topic of career guidance has been along for very long. Employment services have been dealing with it for a quite a long time. It has been, I think, for many years, been kind of an extra service for academics, for only specific groups. And throughout the years, it has developed into something more mainstreamed and something that is in, in many ways uh, a part of the core service of public employment services nowadays. On a functional level, I think uh, it is something that could be even called a tool of social equity and, and social inclusion because it, it helps to, to um, increase the effectiveness and efficiency of labor market, balance with education, balance with training. So it's something that puts together many different parts that are important to make employment and employment services a success, to reduce skills matches, to reduce, uh, to, to improve skills matches, to reduce skills gaps, to reduce dropouts, uh, and altogether boosting productivity and, and making uh, matches more successful. So in a nutshell, uh, it's maybe also on the human level, uh, it's empowering job seekers to become more self-confident in their job search, to um, know their skills better, to manage their careers in a better way. And I uh, think, uh, and I think we'll all agree on that and discuss that too, that especially with teenagers, but also basically everybody uh, who is in a, in a job career, uh, the uncertainty of how will my career evolve? Uh, what can I do next? Uh, especially when I'm confronted with hardship or with a, a uh, situation where my job has to change because it's been automated to my old job or because my skills are no longer relevant or because I'm job starting and I don't have any experience. So a uh, guidance can be crucial to put me on the right track and to make mm, help me do the right choices. There is quite a lot of review on uh, seeing into how adult careers evolve in a better way if they get career guidance from an early stage. So the earlier I uh, make up my mind of what I want to do as a job, uh, how I can best invest my skills, the better the career will evolve in the later stage. So um, it is crucial, even if in some public employment services or in some uh, human resource development entities, it doesn't get the attention it deserves. So um, in many ways, there's, I think, a lot to do still with career guidance uh, and career services in, in, uh, in a way, in an orientation. So we will hear uh, from the experts that we invited um, a lot of examples and opinions on where it is going. Maybe just very briefly from what I saw over the years and uh, also updated uh, my knowledge now, I think um, 
fields to work on in career guidance are how to bring this into the digital age uh, and also an age where uh, the, the jobs are changing. What does that mean? What does career guidance mean? Um, how do we support staff that is supposed to deliver career guidance? Uh, because some of them have a background that basically is geared towards career guidance, others don't. Suddenly they get it on their uh, portfolio. Um, so it's a question, do they have the right skills? How do they manage to deliver career guidance that is of high quality um, in, in settings that it developed into a core tasks? And, um, and then also among the users, uh, the job seekers, and also the employers, uh, how do we promote career guidance in a way that um, it is sold as, as what it is and a, a very good asset to uh, employment services and uh, in many ways the game changer maybe for careers of people because career guidance is maybe not as known as it should be also among the clients. So with that said, uh, I'd like to come to the end of this brief introduction and would like to pass the word over to Eamon for the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Miguel, and for that very helpful overview of the subject, which I think um, indicates, I'm sure, that we're going to have a very, very interesting discussion on the most important subject. Um, as Miguel mentioned, we're very grateful to have a very distinguished panel of experts in our discussion uh, today. Um, Francis Dumara from the International Labour Organization uh, is currently supporting public employment services in Costa Rica, Senegal, Morocco and Ethiopia. So a very broad global perspective. Um, he's helping them with their strategic thinking and particularly on their modernization projects. He's also contributing at the moment to a number of other research projects on active labor market policy design and implementation. And Francois has designed and authored a set of practical guides which are intended to help support employment services in the increasing professionalization of their teams. Deirdre Hughes, uh, the Associate Professor from the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom, specialises in careers, employment and skills policy, particularly research and practice at the international, national and regional level. Um, she is a founding director of Career Chat UK Limited, which is a, a technology startup company which is doing some very pioneering work at the moment, looking at how technology can be applied to increase the efficiency of career advice and exploration. And she's particularly at the moment very focused on the use of artificial intelligence and large language models, which are very, very key to the development of career guidance in a rapidly evolving technological environment. Um, Claudia Leibenberg is a careers advisor for the public employment service in Germany and is particularly involved in career support for young people. Alan Kitsupan is the head of project preparation uh, for the public employment service in Croatia. Um, Anika has a vast experience in the field of public employment services going back over two decades looking at a number of employment policy fields, particularly socio-economic development and the place of employment services within that uh, field, uh, the management of European Union funded contracts and especially capacity building in public employment services. I'd like to start our discussion by bringing uh, Francois in and asking them a couple of questions, I think to very much set the frame for this very broad subject and our discussion today. Um, Francois, I'd like to begin by perhaps asking you what I think is maybe a fundamental question. Um, what policy standing do you think that career guidance has in the current incredibly rapidly evolving labour market? So how does career guidance fit in, essentially? Thanks, Simon. Thanks uh, a lot for this uh, question. Um, I think we can say that the current labour market is marked by two phenomena currently. First, the acceleration of change. And second, the lack of visibility about the future. When I talk about the acceleration of change, I'm talking about the increasingly rapid evolution that the, uh, our profession and our companies are experiencing under the influence of several factors. What are these factors? First, we know, of course, technology, technology and digital. Second factor, the need to take climate change into account. Third factor, 
demographics, particularly with the aging of population in northern countries. With this change, we know that many professions disappear. Others are created. Almost all of them evolve. When I talk about lack of visibility, about the future, I'm obviously referring to the multiple political, health, financial, or social crises, which follow one another or accumulate. They have the effect of reducing clarity on the economic future, both for employers and for employees. They also increase mental distress, particularly among young workers who are very pessimistic about their future. And the first consequence of change in profession is the end of linear careers. A worker no longer stay in the same position for the 40 years of his professional life. It is estimated that he will have to change position of job, profession on average five times. This average will tend to increase. And in the decade to come, it will be more and more. Consequently, each worker will confront it several times in their professional life with the stress of unemployment, job searching, or even the need to change job and update their skills. So in this context, car guidance services are increasingly essential. It is about supporting each worker to manage transition in their professional life. For this, the employment services are essential players. And governments, therefore, have really a great interest in investing in public employment service and their career guidance actions, because these actions are also essential for companies which need to find candidates with the right skills. So career guidance is therefore essential for the proper functioning of a country economy. And I think it's a profitable invest investment for employment policies. Thank you very much. I think you've very, very helpfully set the scene for us and explaining how career guidance is increasingly important, if not essential, and particularly the kind of increasing need for employers of very well orientated potential employees, but also the more difficult and stressful environment within which kind of uh, job seekers are operating. Um, you mentioned the speed of change, Francois. I think that's absolutely the case. The world is moving more and more quickly. Um, in many discussions a couple of years ago, I often heard the same comment from colleagues, and that was that COVID had driven six years worth of change in six months. It was an incredible kind of uh, shock to society's general, but the labour market in particular. Um, would you be able to share any thoughts with us as to how perhaps the field of career guidance has changed as a consequence of the COVID pandemic? Yes, of course, we, we know COVID was <laughs> an incredible uh, change. Uh, you know that during COVID, uh, we have to know that during uh, the COVID crisis, guidance services have been in high demand due to the closure of uh, several sectors of the economy, uh, tourism, catering, and other. And many workers wanted to change jobs and professional sectors. And after this crisis, many sectors suffered from labor shortage also. And the labor market has, has been severely disrupted and unbalanced with the COVID crisis. This has really increased the need for career guidance services. And the employment services have I think I've re reinvested in the subject in several ways. First, by the training of the employment advisor, and it's the first uh, step, of course. 
also by deploying uh, new online digital tools. We know during the COVID, we discover again <laughs> digital tools. And so they, they deploying new online digital tools. For example, for uh, labor market information, they implemented new information support about profession and about the labor market. And of course, they also develop remote services, video interviews, online workshop on car gardens, and uh, also online uh, recruitment fairs and all, all these kinds of tools. Thank you. So you're really describing, I think there, Francois, how career guidance is in a sense operating within an entirely new almost paradigm as a consequence of COVID. Um, you mentioned very helpfully the tools that are needed to make sure that career guidance meets the need. Could you perhaps share any thoughts with us about particular skills you think that are required for adequate career guidance to make the best use of these tools particularly? About skills, we, we can say that uh, currently for some public employment service, uh, more and more employment service, uh, the priority today is to support job seekers so that they will acquire the skills to find their way on their own, in autonomy. Indeed, we know that their professional career will be marked by different hazards. It's therefore important that they learn to deal with it themselves, so as not to suffer of uh, this hazard. They must become, we said in, in their law, they must become the pilot of their professional career and not only just be a passenger of their professional career. And to do this, it is important for each employee to monitor the development of their profession and their company also. Uh, each uh, employee need to continually update his skills and identify change in his professional sector. This will allow him to anticipate, to manage his career, to size opportunities, and not suffer of the hazard, as I said. And finally, in this context of uh, ultra rapid evolution uh, in profession, we know that employers favor soft skills rather than technical skills. In particular, companies are looking for autonomous, adaptable candidates who are able to organize their work and prioritize the activity to be carried out. And so workers must understand that. They must integrate these trends and invest in these uh, soft skills. And I think public employment service could support them to do that. Thank you very much, Francois, for that splendid um, scene setting. And I particularly liked your uh, description of people receiving career guidance or job seekers being the pilot, not the passenger for their <laughs> career trajectory. I think that's a very, very helpful kind of a strapline or metaphor for what we hope people will be able to do. Um, you very helpfully mentioned autonomy several times and increasing autonomy has been a particular theme of lots of discussions about delivery of careers and employment service advice in recent years. And of course, one of the uh, enablers for autonomy is greater application of technology. So I'd like to bring in Deirdre now, if I may, um, particularly ask her an introductory question about the use of AI. I saw recently an advertisement for an event which was called quite challengingly and perhaps dauntingly, um, Artificial intelligence is introducing a dystopia or a utopia in the labour market, which I think kind of covers the kind of great opportunities, but also the extreme concerns and many, many shades in between those two rather polarised statements. But particularly, Deirdre, um, could you share with us your views on how artificial intelligence and perhaps large language models can really help offer this kind of personalised service, particularly in career guidance that is required to enable people to realize their potential. So how can large language models and AI help deliver this personalized service and facilitate the kind of autonomy that Francois helpfully described for us? Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Eamon. And I, I think that uh, starting off with utopia or dystopia is a very um, uh, good way of actually looking at the subject. AI is supposed to make life easier when it comes to information, advice and guidance to support individuals with their decision making. And of course, traditionally, this has been provided by human careers advisors who offer this personalized support, shared experiences and emotional support. And I think the field of um, career guidance and in particular, um, the public employment service and um, within all of that is a cornerstone of employability and workforce development. Perhaps just um, before sort of setting out the sort of the benefits, as it were, um, of this, it's useful to remind ourselves that um, the OECD, the European Commission, ILO, UNESCO, the European Training Foundation and CEDAFOP have um, come together and produced um, public policy uh, papers aimed at ministers and other advisors, reminding us all of the importance of um, uh, career guidance. And I think one of the, the big challenges here is really looking at, well, how can we use um, artificial intelligence as a social technology, not just as disruptive technology, which is what we often see it uh, framed as. So um, over the last two and a half years, I've specifically been really looking at how do we ensure um, that we can um, provide ethical uh, response to careers information advice. And I look at it through the lens of chatbots, but I think in a public employment um, service, let's sort of have a look maybe and think about five advantages of AI in career guidance. So the first advantage is scalability. Um, AI driven careers information and advice can reach a broader audience, uh, connecting to, um, if you like, professionally trained um, careers experts uh, when needed. I think secondly, personalization, as you mentioned, Eamon, often AI can offer personalized recommendations that are based on interest skills and uh, occupational preferences. And I would add that it will enable individual to undertake career exploration on their own terms in a safe place and space where they feel most comfortable to explore um, options. I think thirdly, um, an advantage are the data-driven insights. So AI can easily leverage big data sets. Um, here in, in the UK, um, we've been leveraging Office for National Statistics data, uh, LMI for All, which is a UK um, initiative looking at how we can maximize labor market uh, intelligence. And um, through our work, we've been able to provide real-time access to job vacancies and labour market um, trends that will support, if you like, um, informed choices. Fourthly, um, and this is where, I guess, ministers and policymakers like it's cost effective. AI can quickly respond to those frequently asked questions um, and make more in-depth guidance uh, referrals to human advisors if needed, which saves time and it saves money. And I think finally, and most importantly, um, is the empowerment action of AI-driven careers information, advice and guidance, in that it not only empowers the man and woman on the street to be able to um, undertake career exploration um, uh, on their own terms, but it will empower the practitioners to stay ahead, if you like, of the curve in keeping up to date with labour market trends, learning more about what their clients or their customers are actually exploring in advance of having a one-to-one -one meeting or being in a group setting and analysing the data trends. So there are a lot of advantages um, to AI. And I just would end by saying that um, it's helpful, I think, in a public employment service context to recognise the limitations of digital. These are, you know, lockdown systems and, and sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to innovate um, in a public employment uh, service context. 
um, uh, then perhaps outside of that for reasons that everyone who works in the public employment service and will know. But if we built a scenario where in the future we're looking at uh, the human support forming the backbone, if you like, of a support system, but having AI tools and chatbots, um, that sort of 24 hour um, sort of engagement, virtual reality, um, integrate into career guidance sessions, which we see quite a lot in schools. Gaming and gamification, if you look at the numbers around people who are involved in gaming and uh, how that can be used, for example, in a career guidance context in Wales, um, the uh, Careers Wales, the National Career Service, has over 6 million users of something called CareerCraft, which is a version of Minecraft. And of course, you know, all the data-driven insights. So there's huge potential. Thank you, Didger. I think you've uh, a given us an extremely balanced and helpful kind of um, picture of the way that AI can perhaps be more of a social than a disruptive technology and moved us a bit away from that sort of poll. Um, I think that you also hinted at issues perhaps to do with the ethics of deploying AI. Um, there's something about how we can ensure there's the required emotional connection and empathy when we're delivering services through uh, artificial means rather than the kind of traditional person human um, contact. Um, I wanted to kind of pursue something with you about some of the practical application of deploying AI in a career guidance context. Um, as I think we all know, lots of AI works on principles of machine learning and self-learning and a degree of a black box. Um, yeah. There have been some quite interesting articles in the press in the last six months about some quite concerning difficulties with AI based on algorithms making some quite socially challenging or unacceptable kind of decisions. And some incredibly skilled IT experts have been unable to work out why the machine has done what it's done because of the black box and the machine learning kind of consequence. So in one reason, I was thinking of that famous um, Fantasia, the Walt Disney film from the 1930s, when Mickey Mouse starts to try to wave his magic wand and lots and lots of people start self-cleaning you know, the house to remember it. And this seemed to me a bit perhaps what could be happening with um, some elements of AI if we're not too careful. So I suppose, did you? how do you think we can ensure the quality in career guidance technology and we don't get some really kind of unforeseen and difficult outcomes that nobody would have wanted when they set the system up. Well, I think you're absolutely uh, right in what you're saying here, Eamon, that quality assurance, quality assurance has to be at the heart of any AI powered career guidance uh, technology. One, to make sure it's accurate, two, that it's ethical, and three, that it's effective, you know, for individuals. And I think there's a number of ways in which you can do it. I think in terms of the algorithms, you know, there has to be algorithm transparency, make the algorithms transparent and explainable, allowing the end users to understand how the, the recommendations are generated. I'll give you an example in CC, the careers um, chatbot. We have a card sort embedded within that, and we make it explicit that um, that card sort is based on personal attributes and it's linked to John Holland's theory um, of um, uh, sort of career uh, decision making. And um, so I think there's something about that. Um, we almost need a, a sort of set of benchmarks, and I'll say a little bit more about benchmarks. But I think, um, you know, your starting point always has to be the, you know, ensuring the quality of the data and those ethical um, considerations. So the data used to train an AI system has to be accurate and up to date and represent diverse populations. And this is a real challenge. A practical challenge in the UK is our Office for National Statistics um, data uh, on what's the average pay of someone um, would earn um, is up to 2020 and we're now in 2023. So at a glance, you think, well, is that really accurate? So you have to find ways of actually ensuring that um, you know, the way of making sure your data is accurate in terms of job vacancies is to make sure that you've got the link to the big data sets on real life vacancies and then someone can, can marry up the two. I think the most important, well, all of these are important, but regular training and testing as well, you know, making sure that you're updating um, the AI model. 
I think there's a danger that people think, for example, with ChatGPT or Bing or with Bard, oh, well, what we need to do is to ask it questions and we'll get the answers. And we know for sure that um, AI systems um, do hallucinate. So, for example, it said I was a professor at Derby University. Well, I did work there before, but I'm a professor at Warwick University. So I think we have to understand the limitations of this. And we need regular uh, sort of uh, training. I think one of the other things that we can um, really ensure the quality aspect is to get the user feedback and to think, how does that voice of the user look back into the public employment service? Um, are we um, basically just going for a shiny new tool or are we actually collecting feedback from the users and the careers or, or employability uh, counsellors to make sure that the quality of what we're providing um, is good. What I have found uh, in all quality assurance debates and any new digital tool, you have the choice sometimes of just grabbing a tool and giving it to the advisors and saying, we've looked at this and we think it's great. It's absolutely essential, I think, when we're looking at the human and the AI collaboration, that we have that in career guidance, where AI serves as a valuable tool to support rather than replace the human and career counsellors. And I do think that we need um, uh, to make sure there's no bias. We need that bias mitigation techniques in there um, to make sure that it doesn't discriminate, uh, you know, on factors like gender or socioeconomic status. Uh, there's a whole list of, uh, list of other, other things um, that, that uh, we could come up with. And I'll put in the chat an article around um, six key tips uh, to ensure ethics um, when using um, artificial uh, intelligence. But I think one of the most important aspects is the training of the um, advisors it's no use giving them a tool and expecting them to use it and monitoring performance. The advisors need to feel a real sense of ownership for that quality assurance for the end user themselves and um, the person coming into um, the pairs. And it does have to have some ethical oversight, um, you know, linked to um a set of ethical standards. And there aren't that many around <laughs> in terms of AI at the moment. Um, a number of professional bodies are looking at this and government are looking at how they can put guardrails around AI. But in a public employment service context, I would suggest that those guardrails have to be really put in place and that everyone is confident um, and competent in being able uh, to use um, artificial intelligence to really, really good effect. Thank you, Didri. I've got this wonderful picture in my mind of hallucinating artificial intelligence, which I think <laughs> is kind of incredible. But um, yeah, thank you. Lots of very helpful uh, comments there. Um, indeed, some public employment services around Europe are looking at setting up ethics committees to decide on what the boundaries should be for deploying this technology. I think there's a very live debate as well about not only training staff, but also what you do to kind of allay staff fears and garner staff acceptance of new technology, which of course has been going on forever. But I think the new technology is perhaps more profoundly different in terms of its implications for the job than changes that we've had um, previously. Um, you mentioned profiling, I think, as well, which is very, very interesting. The ability to profile individuals is far more um, powerful than it ever has been before. Um, I think some organizations are looking at what they call nonlinear profiling, building one of Francois's comments earlier. But that means that there's the ability for the state to have an incredibly rich source of information about all aspects of an individual citizen's life, actually. And there are questions about, I suppose, how far people want that and how far it's appropriate to have that body of information and how it's used. Um, fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. And um, lots and lots there to think about, not just now, but perhaps after our uh, discussion this afternoon. Um, I'd now like to bring in um, Claudia, if I may, for a discussion about some of the very, very kind of um, essential questions that we need to consider about how we deliver career guidance in the field and operationally. 
Um, perhaps, Claudia, first of all, um, there's often a debate about when career guidance should actually start and how long it's appropriate for a spell or a course of career guidance to continue with an individual client. Um, have you got any particular views from your experience about when you think it's the best time to start an intervention with a citizen and at what stage you think really it's now time to kind of take a step back and let the person act on the very good advice they've received from you and your colleagues? Thank you. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Um, um, as you uh, maybe know, is the past Germany um, has the legal mandate in Germany for career orientation. And uh, that means to prepare young people and also adults for career choices and to inform about seeking training, job seekers, employees, and also employers. Um, the, the early discussion of decisions that are relevant for the choice of career should help to make it easier, especially here's the question of transition into the training system and study. And as Miguel mentioned already, we think it is really important to start very early. So in our case, um, I'm especially responsible for children or young uh, people uh, who are in uh, grade or in class nine, this is in the, in the age of 14, 15. And then um, they try to get their A-levels or Abitur, as you would say in Germany, uh, to get the access to university or uh, to um, professional training. Um, and for these uh, young people, we start in the age of 14, 15. And we try to encourage them to make an internship to find out how it feels like to, to work in a special field that they are interested in. Also, we encourage them to um, join study fairs and uh, to come to KI. <laughs> uh, the, the previous part is maybe just uh, trying to do a test in the internet about um, like it's, it's like an online tool we have for young people it's called check you to find out more about um, what uh, would you like to do would you more like to work inside or outside more in a team or more for yourself and uh, it's an altogether uh, I think three hours uh, test uh, you can make uh, little breaks, of course, um, to, yeah, to, to find out uh, what, what is uh, maybe the right one for, for each of the pupils. And this uh, could be also uh, be done in the age of, uh, I would say, 16 or even 17. They leave the school uh, with 18 and then uh, we would say uh, at least uh, one to two years before it's I would say the hot uh, part of uh, finding the right uh, profession or finding what to study and so this is uh, what we would recommend. Thank you very much Claudia. Um, lots and lots of the literature um, refers to the need for far more effective school to work transitions. I think it's an oft neglected area. And also there's a view that um, it's quite unusual for career advisors to be speaking to people early enough. And I think you've very helpfully explained how that can be done and the benefits of it, which I think all the evidence suggests that really does pay dividends. Um, often advice for young people, children or, or younger adults compared to older job seekers is often described by practitioners as requiring a very different approach and perhaps different kind of skills really. Um, would you be able to share with us what you think might be some of the differences in providing this kind of invaluable advice to younger people compared to the discussion you might have if you were offering this advice to an older job seeker? Mm -hmm. um, older job seeker are normally uh, already in the job and uh, so 
they don't need to have so many uh, information about what you all, all can do, uh, but uh, often they have difficulties, uh, for instance, um, maybe with their health, they need to change the job or maybe they don't feel right anymore uh, in this profession they started. And so the difference is um, it's much more uh, counseling for uh, about further education or about um, uh, maybe how, so actually you have two options, either you change the profession completely or which is much uh, more likely you um, adjust your job that it fits again. So that, ne that means, um, for instance, uh, with further education within the job, Uh, or uh, also with other job enrichments, you can change a little bit the, the job you already have. Um, we try in the counseling to medi mediate between the employees or um, and employer. Um, we also have an online tool for the older ones. It's called New Plan. And then uh, they can find out, is it... Uh, important to change the job or can we just uh, adjust it a little bit so uh, the the german um, um, employment service uh, works also with the chamber of crafts and the chamber of commerce so it's uh, networking and so uh, we try to to help the the people to find their way Thank you very much. So a different emphasis based on people's past really experience and a different situation they're in, whether they've worked before or whether they're kind of starting out on their um, pathway. Um, I'd like to ask one final question, Claudia, for this stage of the discussion. Um, I think Francois very helpfully explained to us why careers and guidance is increasingly important, given the incredible labour market disruption and the speed of change. Deirdre very helpfully explained how the application of technology can um, assist greatly the career guidance uh, profession and our ability to help people to deal with these changes. But one of the eternal questions in the whole field of career guidance or employment service advice is that some of the people who most need assistance are the least likely to come into contact with well, our organizations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm very sorry. Uh, my son came uh, early as I uh, thought, but everything is fine. I just uh, opened the door. Okay, uh, no I understand. Yes, <laughs> so, yes, no, 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 not at all. So I think the um, the difficulty can be that the people who most need the very good services that you offer in your organization can be those least likely to easily come into contact with them. So the paradox is some of the most hardest to help people, most in need of guidance and orientation, perhaps less likely to actually seek our assistance. Um, have you got any kind of hints for us, Claudia, or experience you could share with us about how we can offer career guidance to those fathers from the labour market and bring them into the kind of a service, actually, so you can help them? Any views on that? So um, I think I can better speak um, for the area of young people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, for the for the adults, uh, it's um, mostly the the networking. What we try to to help, um, also to to reach the the people who need uh, help hardest. Uh, but uh, in the area of young people, uh, we have two. Um, I would say points. Uh, so one thing is uh, in the in the older times, I would say it was uh, that uh, young people had to come to the employment agency to get help, and of course this was a, a difficult access. And uh, so since I would say three four years, uh, we changed the system, and the career advisor counselor come to school to the school so uh, each advisor has his own school and has a partnership with a teacher in the school to 
to to be just uh, in the place where this where the pupil are this is uh, very important so for instance i have uh, let's say two schools uh, i'm responsible for and so the the pupil know every Tuesday I'm in their school and uh, can help them straight away if they, for instance, uh, think, oh, they uh, can't make the, the exam or they need a different uh, way because they can't uh, reach the A-levels, so though they need a different uh, way to, to go on. And... Um, so uh, this is uh, very important. We see that we have this uh, cooperation uh, with the school and uh, very close, um, just uh, the place where this, the pupil are, we are as well. This is very important. And the second thing, thing is um, it, um, we have uh, in the German employment agency, um, something it's called several players under one roof and that means we have in our employment agency not only uh, us as a uh, career counselor we have also a team with what makes coaching psychological uh, counseling we have also a addiction counseling in the house uh, debt advice um, we have also a youth migration service for young people with migration background and also the job center if they want to look for a job besides school. So um, I think this helps a lot to um, reach people in their different, difficult, maybe difficult situations. And so I think this is kind of best practice I can really recommend. Thank you very much, Claudia. So clearly, um, very visible services and interagency cooperation can apply holistic support to people and enable their career uh, advice to be placed in a broader context dealing with other problems as well. That's extremely helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to bring in Ankitsa now for a few kind of uh, discussion points about the relationship between public employment services and career guidance. Um, I remember attending an event in Brussels, which must be frighteningly perhaps a couple of decades ago now with some of Deirdre's colleagues from Warwick and the theme of the discussion was why employment services and career services so rarely speak to each other actually I think that position has changed over the time but at that stage these were seen as incredibly different and disconnected disciplines which I think is really rather odd but one exception so that situation has always been Croatia, where there's been a long tradition of a very close relationship between careers advice and employment services, which I think everybody would agree is extremely logical. But perhaps, Ankitsa, could I ask you what employment services clients really expect from a career guidance service? What are they hoping to achieve when they engage with your very nicely combined operation? Thank you. I think you're muted, Ankitsa. Thank you, Eman, and thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. I see the red microphone. Uh, <laughs> thank thank you, you, Eman, and thank you for the invitation for this uh, panel. Uh, well, actually, there is a long tradition, yes, in, in Croatia of uh, employment service being together with, with the career guidance. Uh, we see it as it's uh, like a finger, nail and the finger. That's one, one body. That's why we, when when um, having this as I would say one body, that's how we uh, cooperate and uh, the, how how we uh, cooperate with the, our partners and how we act towards our clients. And in order to answer that question on 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 their expectations, uh, we have worked along together with employment uh, services because uh, to start with. Once you enter the employment service, you are entering something that um, premise service, something that you expect something from these people. And these expectations could be different, different depending on the client. From when, when you take a look at the client perspective, the, the, the career guidance uh, 
can be identified clearly if you look at the position of the career, career guidance at the particular how it fits to the different phase of the customer pathway in a life, whether it's that person is at the beginning of the, of the life, work life, middle, late phase, uh, etc. Uh, when talking like this, we have to say that in Croatia, we have a also long tradition of um, entering uh, premises of primary and secondary schools in order to, to, let's say, to at that early stage, assist those uh, in need for, for seeking for, the, for their future education or future, for future profession. From employment perspective, when you take a look career guidance today, positions itself as a kind of a method uh, that supports employees in their labor market tra transition and helps them to deal with, the, with those tra traditions all around their work life and including uh, trainings and, uh, and, uh, and the need to grow and develop more. Um, different generations also, we have to be... Uh, aware that our premises and our services are entering different generations with different backgrounds, economic, social, educational, lifestyle, etc. And they have different experiences, values, perspectives, so they have a different expectations. Well, uh, despite all these differences, they all, when they come, uh, you could put the bottom line of the similarities, they all want to have a meaningful work. They all want to make a difference in their work. They all want to live happy life, fulfilling life, etc., etc. And nowadays, when the baby boomers are retiring, the X generation is, well, at least this first part of X generation, is preparing for putting one, gla lang one leg to get off the labor market. And new kids are on the block. And these new ones, the, they, they, they really need, they want, and they seek the, the, these different approaches. But all of them, they can learn from each other, and we can learn from them, because by knowing them, we are uh, also making deeper our knowledge on their needs and possibilities to, to fulfill the, this, these needs. Uh, so in that way, they, they, we can identify the skills and their and the interests they have, develop their paths, uh, find jobs that they're, that they're best fit for them. And uh, we can also uh, kind of uh, see the, the, the diversities in the groups of people that come from, from different walks of life and they have different needs. Bottom line, uh, we need to know our clients, whether they are youngsters who are graduating schools, they don't know what to do, they are new to the workforce, they need to assistance to identify career options, uh, whether they are adults who are re-entering, you know, the workforce after a break, I don't know, whatever it's... Uh, going to education, uh, break due to child care, etc. People who are losing their jobs, being laid off, becoming unemployed, underemployed people, mid-career professionals who wants to change careers due to growth, or they're unhappy in their positions, or they're new in the field, or people with disabilities, or people with different um, the disadvantage of marginal, marginalized groups, they all have expectations. And in Croatia, they are, these expectations are legally supported because in Croatia, our public employment service has a legal mandate for preparation for employment and mediation. And this preparation for employment includes professional guidance, includes this development of career management skills, includes support in defining, creating professional plan agreement for inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. But what these clients want from us, they want the focus. The focus today is different than the focus like 20 years ago. The focus 20 years ago is like uh, identify their skills. This is a job, match them. That's it. But today, they, uh, the things are changed. We need to match their skills, competencies, values. But we need to like walk them through the life of career transition for the future life that they could they could get so instead of permanent job we walk towards the permanent employability and in in that our clients they want oriented services oriented to them so this the focus is on the autonomy of their personal uh, rights 
their development, their career. Uh, we have to act on on like kind of the in in best interest of them. We have to be impartial. We have to take care of data confidentiality within this business. Uh, we have to uh, answer the questions of equal uh, opportunities. The approach has to be holistic and tailor-made, taking account personal, social, cultural, economical, all the factors. And at the same time, they seek from us active participation. They want cooperation with the, with the, with the, with the counselor. They want this cooperation to be continuous it's, a, it's like kind of uh, this digital world gives possibility of 24 hours contact. So that's like, but it's impossible. So in this, we have to balance this uh, accessibility and availability of these services. But these services, they need to be transparent as they are requested by our clients to be like that. They have to be user-friendly. They have to be flexible. And of course, in when you take all of that, personalized, tailored to their individual needs, comprehensive, all up-to-dated, all uh, actionable, practical. They all need to be uh, kind of uh, in person, online, on the phone, and they all expect these services to be free or at a low cost. At the same time, they could have like kind of, I don't know, specific expectations and specific expectations are whether they are new to workforce or returning or facing discrimination or, or, or other other uh, challenges that can arise in the in the labor market. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so clearly they've got expectations for um, very, very accessible, available services, very personalized services. Um, and they are really seeking your help to guide them through a very, very changing world at the moment. Um, you mentioned about dealing with transitions. I think the need for uh, employment advice to be all about dealing with lots of transitions for lots of people and helping them keep their labour market attachment means that perhaps increasingly career support and employment advice will converge actually as disciplines are certain there will be much more closer uh, connections between the organisations delivering both of these. Um, Building on that, you mentioned how there's a legal mandate in Croatia, which uh, establishes the basis for this very well joined up system that you provide. Um, perhaps could you share with us as well as the fact you've got a legal mandate, which uh, defines this uh, joined up service. Can you offer any other thoughts on how you can best design career guidance to ensure that in its delivery, it's very well integrated with the sort of job intermediation services as well? So what do you do to kind of design a service that means these two strands are very closely aligned? Any particular tips you've got yeah. for us? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, for instance, uh, career guidance, uh, we have uh, built in our services, like the scope of our services within the premises. But also we have uh, CSOC centers, centers for informing and counseling on career development that are recognized by the users uh, for, uh, uh, for but that are recognized uh, by users as very useful. Uh, these centers are not in our premises. They are outside of like kind of public institution and they're open to the, to the, to the audience. Um, these uh, users, uh, do not need uh, to be necessarily in our registry. When we talk about this legal mandate, then we have to say that in uh, Croatia, this legal mandate, I would say that first we had these services working together, then we had uh, legally supported them because this uh, employment uh, services have started like kind of uh, in uh, uh, 1905 and counseling services 1936 and during the time they merged today they are merged and nowadays these guidance uh, especially the guidance uh, in is prepared in collaboration with employers with the uh, stakeholders with schools educational institutions in order to give the best possible service to our clients uh, when we design and uh, uh, when we design career guidance, then we uh, 
make this career guidance as a core component of the intermediation services. That means that uh, career guidance is available to the clients regardless of their job search stage or employment status. They could be integrated in all aspects on, of, of, of our mediation service from job matching uh, 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 because career guidance is integrated in the job matching process. For instance, career counselors work with the clients to identify skills, to prepare them for future jobs or, or to match them, or they work also with the, with the employers uh, to, to, uh, to find the solutions for the employers to grow their uh, 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 human resources. We also make sure that um, we personalize career guidance services. Uh, that means that the time frame to understand the client, client's needs, interests, and the goals is set up uh, to work with the clients. Uh, um, we try to prepare and make this career guidance service comprehensive to include all aspects of the of the career development, including planning, job search skills, resume, letters, preparations, networking, uh, uh, emerging with the new industries, uh, like new skills required for, for each person. Uh, also, all these activities, especially in its CISOC centers, they are they are uh, they are taken in uh, Com communication and partnerships with other organizations because uh, employers, educational institutions, community, uh, us, uh, we could best provide clients with a wider range of, of, of the services and the supports if we include community in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the service. Uh, also, career guidance here in Croatia is integrated into the training and educational programs because career guidance counselors help uh, our clients to identify skills gap in their skills and identify the training needs and to assist them to um, develop a plan for completing their training or education. And also the career guidance is uh, kind of integrated in the job placement services uh, because um, our counselors help potential um, employers to create the network and to find better uh, job openings and to provide better job openings. And also sometimes, but it's very rarely, they can negotiate salaries and the benefits. But it's very rarely, and it includes the the migrant uh, migrant population. So, uh, in doing so, I have to say that we use technology to deliver service. We train our staff, of course. Without training of staff, you cannot provide the proper service. Uh, our career guidance policies and the procedures are well long time ago developed so it's like kind of you do things by the book uh, you uh, follow the process you monitor the process you have evaluate the career guidance procedures and uh, by 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 following these tips we can design and implement uh, effective guidance services because like uh, kind of uh we have to take care of continuous improvement in, in the service provision and the channels of communications that we provide services because uh, we focus more on individual person's relationship with kind of work life, giving them methodology to support them in planning this uh, work and the life to combine work-life balance and to have the work-life balance on, 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 on their desirable, not ours, but their uh, desirable level and uh, these modern monitoring and follow-up methods uh, describe their development in more in more like kind of holistic holistic way uh, the key elements of successful career making is here skills clarity of goals trustfulness blah 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 oops sorry and uh, by doing so we have to also uh, have a strong this the strong quality assurance of our services to develop these follow up and monitoring methods to give this uh, the best approach and give the best uh, the best uh, uh, model or proposal for for our clients okay thank you Ankit, for those uh, 
very interesting insights. So I think it's really all about putting career guidance very much at the center of intermediation is what you're kind of sharing with us there very much. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I have to say one thing, like mediation cannot be without guidance. Yeah. Uh, if you want to do proper mediation, you have to have a proper career guidance. And if you want to have a proper mediation, proper career guidance uh, give you proper profile of a client, uh, gives you, that's why even the general counselors have to have some knowledge of career guidance in their, in their everyday's work, not only specialized career guidance counselors, but the general employment employment counselors as well have to have kind of theoretical knowledge in order to, to better do the profiling segmentation in order to prepare proper activation and integration plan. So Thank it's you. it's important to to have it. So important to make sure that staff have the necessary skills and in some cases acquire new skills as well. Thank you very much. Um, in these very interesting discussions, uh, we always find that time is very much our enemy, and it's remarkable how quickly an hour goes by we're having some very interesting uh, discussions. What I was going to do, perhaps before handing back to Miguel for some conclusions, was perhaps ask each of our panellists, if I may, if they could just briefly, perhaps in no more than a couple of sentences, say what they think are the real key factors in ensuring that effective career guidance can be delivered as part of insure employment services. So any two particular things that you think are absolutely crucial to ensure that career guidance can be effectively delivered as part of an employment service. And perhaps if I could start with um, Francois, please. Thank you. Just any two things that you would really say are top of your list to achieve <laughs> the aim of our discussion this afternoon. Uh, I, I think it's a very difficult uh, question because uh, there are many many points, but uh, I will uh, continue on the idea that uh, Antika uh, explained just a few minutes ago uh, about training for uh, employment counselors. Uh, public employment service uh, need to act, of course, on career guidance to propose uh, very relevant uh, services. And to do that, uh, they really need to have uh, big effort to train uh, their counselors and all their counselors because as uh, Ankika said it's not only uh, the topic of some specialists in uh, the employment service but it's the topic the responsibility of each member of the team in uh, public employment service uh, even if you are uh, at the reception desk of the employment service, you need to have uh, some good notions about uh, uh, this topic of care guidance. And it's uh, really uh, very important. This training, a good level of training of the of, of the team. Thank you very much, Francois, very helpful. Um, Deirdre, could we ask you if you had kind of a couple of things at the top of your shopping list, um, what might they be, do you think? More time for uh, counsellors to be able to work effectively in the way that um, was described around skillful practice and career guidance. So that's the first thing on the wish list. Um, we need that triage support system in place. And um, uh, I agree with Francois' training and I would add digital skills training uh, part of that. And then secondly, uh, public employment services cannot survive on an island on their own. Uh, they are part of a bigger careers ecosystem. And so partnerships are vital and being able to focus on places and spaces where people can get really good career support. Uh, so those partnerships, I think, and place-based initiatives would be the second on my list. Thank you very much. The whole idea of the geography of how people operate in the labour market is becoming more and more of a discussion actually. And the fact that where you live can have a quite a profound implication on your ability to succeed on your chosen career path. So thank you very much, extremely interesting. Um, Claudia, if you have two things top of your wish list for what are really the most important things to have to deliver an effective service, what do you think they might be from your perspective? Um, your yeah, two? Um, I think as well, training is initial. Um, the other thing, uh, partnership, uh, as I mentioned, with our uh, all uh, 
things under one roof, what we have. I feel that partnerships are very important or very helpful. And um, the third, actually, uh, Deidre uh, mentioned it before, is I think we should uh, definitely uh, always ask for feedback from our clients to get more, to, to stay closer on their needs or to stay still uh, permanently on their needs. So this would be my point. Thank you Thank very you. much. So partnership and particularly making sure that we are listening to what our clients say they want from us and their feedback and how much they benefit from the advice we are giving them. And of course, appropriate training mentioned by everybody. Um, and Keith, perhaps a couple of final comments from you, really. If you've got two things at the top of your list for delivering effective careers advice through an employment service, what would your top two be, do you think? What are the two absolute yeah. essential ingredients? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Eamon. They already took my my favorite <laughs> ones, that's the partnerships yeah. and the client needs. <laughs> that's the bottom line. We are here because of our clients and because of our clients, we have to work on the range of services. Okay, uh, different uh, range of services and definitely channel of communication with them because new kids on the block they want a different approach in comparison to to like x generation and uh, in doing so uh, not only uh, the needs through the range of services and channel of communication. The very important thing is, as we have already mentioned, the the teamwork of the of the of the of the service workers in public employment services. So, in such way, flexibility could be raised and availability of our services. So, I would say, like a range of services with flexibility and availability of the services. Thank you very much. And I think the point you make about flexibility in dealing with people from different demographics is a very, very important one. There are quite a lot of interesting studies looking at the way that people from generations X, Y, and Z, and I'm losing track of the different groups and what age range they refer to, but they Why are having <laughs> they are having very, very different perspectives on the way they view the world of work and society probably based on the fact they've grown up in a very kind of digitally enabled world, actually, compared to sort of some of us who grew up in a very analog world a bit further back into the past. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of our panellists for their really splendid kind of interventions and very informed answers to the questions. Um, and perhaps for the last five minutes of our discussion today, I'd like to hand back to Miguel. If you've got any kind of overall conclusions you could um, offer, having been listening very carefully to those uh, comments for the last sort of hour or so. So Miguel, the floor is yours to conclude the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. <clears throat> and thank you for all these contributions, which I think were very rich, a firework of ideas and, uh, and experiences. So I think um, that will kick off and can uh, go over to a more in-deep discussion among ourselves, but also with others. Um, in a way, what you said now in the last round of, uh, of things you wish for the effectiveness and efficiency of uh, career guidance gave a conclusion already. So I'll just pick a little bit from what I heard in the discussion. Um, we said that we uh, career guidance moves within the services uh, as all the other components of the core business of public employment services in an accelerated and somewhat volatile environment where they world of work is changing, uh, is disrupted, uh, and causes distress. Uh, we also live in a time of perma-crisis, as they call it, where one crisis is kind of combined with the next one, and uh, that gives a lot of challenges. On a more positive note, it's also a, a time where uh, skills open avenues into um, and possibilities that in the past maybe were not so easy to achieve uh, within occupational limits. And now it's a little bit more uh, transitable. So transitions on in a career are important, and career guidance is a is a significant tool to help manage and and uh, and own those transitions. So um, in in times of crisis, also and in times of acceleration, there was a higher demand for career services. This was uh, noted um, in, in by different institutions, including the ILO and in, in surveys. 
so this opens kind of uh, the opportunity to say career guidance really needs to be uh, at the core uh, business of public employment services because it is a tool to manage skills um, and to put, as it was said, the, the, the job seekers in the pilot seat of their careers rather than uh, driving around in a self-driving car or in a, or in a car that is uh, steered by someone else. Um, that also goes together with the image that um, basically we, we're living in a time where uh, we all need to take more responsibility for how we manage our careers, how we do our jobs. It gives us more freedom, but it also gives us more responsibility and autonomy to, um, yeah, have the self-confidence and and the the means to drive your own career. Artificial intelligence or technology in general can be a tool that helps us, supports us in doing so. Um, it is, uh, we said that we, we need a social technology, so not just a disruptive technology, but something that that can actually support and understand the career and can understand the job seeker and is scalable, um, but it also can kind of go to career at different points, explore it in an intelligent way and, and uh, prepare decisions, which is of course, depending on the data quality with which the systems are fed. Uh, that's at the same time, a big challenge, the accuracy, effectiveness, uh, the ethical standards of, uh, of, of data-driven systems, not only in, in, in labor market and employment, of course. And uh, one of the key features of keeping that kind of transparent and, uh, and in good quality is to open a feedback loop with, with the users and not just uh, confront them with a, with a new technology. Um, we said that cooperation is, is key in, in many jurisdictions, uh, in, in many employment services that's already the case, for example, uh, in Germany, we, uh, we see that there's a lot of cooperation with other stakeholders, chambers, for example, but also even centers were set up for um, providing career guidance or employment services that consist not only of the employment service, but also social services, um, a holistic set of uh, partners that, that can help, especially those that are hardest to help to get back into a job or to become more employable. And um, we have <clears throat> talked about the client perspective. We saw that it's an awful lot of expectations uh, in a positive way. It's uh, also something that is quite clear because job seekers nowadays maybe express themselves uh, through more channels and in, in, in ways that are easier or not easier, but are <laughs> easier to understand and then um, um, transfer into services. We said that maybe the bottom line of this different types of expectations we are confronted with as employment services are the underlying values and the driver of people who come to seek the services to uh, make a difference, to have a meaningful job and to have something that basically brings their values together with what they want to do uh, in their careers. And that's, uh, I think, a very good driver to also uh, center the services around it and uh, and, uh, and and assess the quality and guarantee the quality of services. And finally, uh, we said that maybe what career guidance needs to do most in this sea of expectations and possibilities is to give a focus uh, to job seekers. So the basic service of, of guidance and to walk them through the transitions that they face to keep them employable and to help them manage their expectations also. Uh, and for that, it's good to have an integrated service. It's good to have a service that uh, is not mm, driven, it's not mm, kind of uh, made because the law said it, but it's made because it has a useful and natural connection. Uh, and I also heard that there is a co-creative element of bringing employers together, bringing training institutes together, uh, bringing employment service together to create a core business that includes career guidance and does not have to discuss whether career guidance is a nice to have criteria, but it's something that is integral to the service and to everything that public employment service, but also employment service in general need to do. So that's just what I heard. You said a lot more things, but it's all on the video. Uh, we will publish it. We will publish also the sidelining material that you have been uh, so nicely posting in the chat. I'll put this uh, on the YouTube video as well so people can 
have a further read from the publications that you were doing yourself and also that you recommended. And um, if you agree, people uh, might contact you when they see this video to uh, go on with the discussion on this very important topic. Everybody's talking about human-centered design, client-centered design, I think career guidance is, is a crucial tool that has been around for long, so has a good infrastructure. We just need to use it very well. Thanks a lot for your time. It was a pleasure and I uh, wish you a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Have man. a good day. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.